Greetings, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Intersection of Greatness, Using SEL to Improve Climate and Mitigate the Effects of Trauma. Both Harmony and Inspire host these webinars where thought leaders and educators share best teaching practices and tools to support social and emotional learning. These presentations are the opinions and content of our guest speaker and may not necessarily be a direct representation of Harmony or Inspire. For best viewing of this webinar, it is recommended that you shut down your other browsers. Also, if you have questions for our speaker, please feel free to use your question box on your GoToWebinar control panel. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and you will receive a copy of the recording within the next week. If you are watching this webinar live, you will receive a copy of the certificate of completion from GoToWebinar within 48 hours. You can also download a copy of the slide deck today under the handout on your GoToWebinar panel. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker. As the district school psychologist for Caddo Parish Schools in Louisiana, Dr. White currently leads numerous district committees focus on student supports, positive school climates, suicide prevention, bullying prevention, and safe and drug-free schools. Dr. White is the lead responder for all crises in the district. In addition, Dr. White serves as adjunct faculty at LSU Shreveport. Dr. White presents for state, national, and international conferences and publishes both nationally and internationally. Thank you, Dr. White, for joining us and sharing your expertise with us all today. Thank you, John, so much for a wonderful introduction. And I'm so privileged to have this opportunity to be able to share with you some of my perspectives on today, uh, uh, most important lessons of trauma and how they relate to social emotional learning. So without further ado, let's kind of jump on in. I'm going to talk a little bit about adverse childhood experiences and how those impact learning. I'm going to also talk about a little bit about executive processing skills and how that also um, relates back to how individuals that experience trauma may um, have difficulty actually in the classroom or other arenas of their life. And then I'm going to jump into some practical strategies then some preventative initiatives that may help you in your field. And then finally, how all of these things really impact the overall culture and climate of school districts. So before we get started, I'd like to know a little bit about all of you and who I have on this webinar. So it's poll time. John, will you please take it away? Yes, indeed it is poll time. Please take a minute to answer the question on your screen so we can find out more about your background. What is your background? Are you an educator, mental health, cl mental health clinician, school psychologist or counselor, administrator, or something other than what we've listed? You can also share your answers in the question box. We'll give you a few minutes to answer. So I know it's always trying uh, difficult to try to present and kind of gauge your audience, depending on where you're coming in from the various perspectives. But I kind of have a philosophy that I gained from a colleague of mine, and that is if you only learn one new thing a day and you have one new experience every day, your life will be quite rich. So I hope you'll get at least one new idea today from this webinar. Very good, we see a lot of answers coming in. See quite a few educators, social workers, an EA coach, behavior redirector. That's an oh. interesting title. It is an interesting title. I think I've held that title a time or two. <laughs> Program specialist at the state level, very good. So and thank you all for sharing. Oops, I just want to say thank you all for sharing, and now I'll pass it back to you, Dr. White. All right. So it looks like primarily we have more educators than, uh, than anything else, and that's great. All right. So I guess one of the things um, 
with such a diverse audience, I want to make sure that everybody is aware of some pretty important research in terms of how all of this uh, trauma-informed practices really began. And it started over uh, 20 plus years ago with a landmark study that was conducted with Drs. Ande and Felita, uh, Felletti, excuse me, and um, in conjunction with Kaiser, Permanente, and the Center for Disease Control. And so basically what they created was about a 10 question um, questionnaire that you can access online. And it asks you things that prior to the age of 18, did any of these things happen to you? Was there substance abuse issues in the home? Um, were your parents separated or divorced? Did you have any um, sort of household dysfunction? Or were you a, a product that maybe somebody had neglected or abused, or you even were witness to some of those things that were occurring? And so what they really found out is this was the first time that they took all of this adverse childhood experiences and realized that not only did these experiences impact long-term health concerns, but they also tended to impact long-term mental health concerns as well. Now, I also have to have this little caveat because, you know, it's nice to say, and a lot of people want to say, well, you know, if you have X number of A scores, that means this is going to happen to you. But we all know that with humans, we can't be that definitive. What I will remind you of is preventative research. And so when you think about um, the, the negative, you also must think about the positive as well. And so many of us have risk factors, but we also have preventative factors that are in place, and those can add uh, offset some of those negative uh, ACE scores that one may have. The interesting thing about this research is that it was conducted with about 17,000 individuals, and most of those individuals were college educated, and most of them were from middle or upper SES levels. So can you imagine what we may be working with when we actually add in things like um, generational poverty or lower SES scores and those other um, issues that would compound um, this actual study? So some of the things that we get from those ACE scores is we found out that there are a lot of correlational or attributable problems, anything from lung disease to depression, um, even fetal death, uh, mental health problems, smoking, and many, many more. So I think it's important to kind of go over what I th the definition of trauma is. And um, trauma can not only be real, but it also can be a perceived threat. And sometimes, um, people don't realize that perception be can become your reality. And so when you think about a perceived threat, anytime you feel like you're threatened, then your body begins to take over. And the more adverse trauma you have, the more that's grooved into the brain. Um, it also kicks in some, uh, some uh, cortisol and some other types of neurotransmitters and chemicals that, that lead to um, making this easier to get to over and over again. And of course, that's not what we want. We don't want a quick to respond with emotional, um, emotional impact. We would rather have some time to be able to process and recognize. And so one of the things that I think is important is when we look at the trauma, you know, the categories can be anything from abuse to loss to chronic stress. So we all are pretty familiar with emotional abuse. And if you're working in a school system, uh, especially within the last 20 years, you know, there's some foundational research that's been done, longitudinal study over the last 40 years by Dr. Dan Olvaeus, who we recently lost, um, and Clemson University. What people of my time, so back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, um, we really, when we had bullying at school, we really didn't have to worry too much because at 3.30 in the afternoon, that stopped. Unfortunately, with all of the social media sites that are out there today, cyberbullying is a real thing, um, and it lasts long past the, the, the school year and the school day. So um, other things can be institutional. So if you have adults that are um, 
perpetrators of bullying or harassment, um, that also kind of trickles down. And then you also have uh, children that may witness and adults who may witness domestic violence um, and uh, any type of violence. There's some really interesting research that's out there right now. The more um, children are exposed to violence, whether that's television, movies, video games, or in real life, um, the more they become desensitized to those um, things. Yet the body still responds. Um, the brain still responds. In terms of loss, um, one of the, the books that I would refer you back to, and for those of you who are trying to write down some stuff, I have listed this in the very back of this slide presentation, is a couple of books by Dr. Bruce Perry, who talks about uh, the difference between really post-traumatic stress disorder as opposed to complex uh, PTSD. Um, in war, our, our veterans go over, they come back, the, the threat stops. But for children who live in a neighborhood where there's gunfire all the time or there's violence all the time, then the complex trauma is always. Same thing if you have somebody with maybe substance abuse in the home or a chronic pattern of abuse going on in the home. And then finally, just those things that cause uh, chronic stress. So um, family members that may have mental health conditions that are not treated. Um, you may also have generational poverty, which can sometimes become cyclic. And we're beginning to see uh, generational things that actually impact generation after generation with uh, issues such as racism and um, why our, our SEL is so critical to be able to mitigate some of the trauma that, uh, that many of uh, our children experience today. So if you were going to give what I would call Brain Lecture 101, um, I would refer you to the hand model of the brain. And the hand model of the brain was actually created by Dr. Dan Siegel. And so if you think of the brain as uh, the lower brain and the upper brain, um, basically in order to understand uh, the impact of trauma, we basically need to look how the body responds to stress. And so the emotional brain is the lower brain. It's the limbic system and it sends a message when it senses a threat. And when it senses a threat, it basically sounds the alarm and that's automatic and it's unconscious. And so what happens is then the thinking brain or that, ne that neocortex then basically assesses that situation to determine whether or not that danger is real or if it's just a false alarm. And if the upper brain confirms that the threat is real at that point, it temporarily goes offline. So when your children are in the classroom and they are perceiving danger, they're not hearing those words that you're speaking. They're not focused in on the lesson or engaging in the activity, the experiential activities that you have going on in class. They're in pure survival mode. And so their lower brain is telling us, do I need to fight, flee, or freeze? That's all, that's all they can focus on. So trauma, basically causes us to remain in survival mode. And what we see in terms of behaviors is we see like a, a fight response. Um, fight responses we're pretty good at if you're working in a school district. Um, everything from a verbal attack and you're thinking, wow, I didn't do anything, but all of a sudden, you know, this kid is coming at me like I've, like I've said something wrong. Maybe aggression or assaultive behavior. Sometimes it looks like defiance in kids that we work with, uh, even aggressive stance, like you're not gonna do this to me and that like squaring off, or even clenched fist, uh, a clenched teeth. And every once in a while, you'll even see a kid or an adult kind of pink out. They almost go pink all the way up to where, where their hairline is. Um, and that is a, that's what we mean by those fight responses. Those flight responses, all of a sudden the kid is whoop and they're gone and now they're out of your class or they refuse to talk. They avoid the situation that they don't feel comfortable in. Um, I've had kids before that are so traumatized about being left alone in a bathroom that they actually, um, they actually 
hold it all day long rather than having to go into a bathroom. Um, and then finally, for those freeze responses, you know, you may have a kid that's kind of numb. The, the affect is numb. They appear unresponsive when you talk to them. It's like nobody's home. Uh, they're unable to interact or engage with others, or somehow they're just kind of disconnected. So why is this important? Because I know if you're working in a school, you always have to tie it back into academics. Um, you know, students dealing with trauma basically are at a two and a half times uh, more likely chance to fail a grade. They also score lower on standardized achievement tests. They have more receptive and expressive uh, language difficulty. So what does that mean? When you're saying something, especially if they're in that lower brain, they're not being able to listen. And they may not be also able to understand what you're saying at that moment in time. They're more likely to be suspended or expelled, and they're also more likely to be referred for uh, special education services more frequently than, than a child who has not experienced trauma. So when we think about traumatic events, we really kind of have to branch out um, past the, the, the big couple that most of us probably are, are imagining, um, abuse or neglect. Um, even something that's meant as a preventative measure or a life-saving measure, like having uh, multiple hospitalizations in order to uh, save a life or separation um, after a horrific event, you've had a tornado or a flood or something from a natural disaster that's caused families to be broken up and displaced out of their home in a hotel. Sometimes even foster placements, although it's meant to save the children, um, again, are uprooting those kids into a new environment where they have to begin to learn what Dr. Karen Purvis with the traumatic uh, TBRI, which is tr tr trust-based relational intervention with Texas Christian University, would refer to as felt safety. So even though we provide them safe environments, it's not until they feel safe that they can begin to um, experience the fullness of what we have to offer. So what kind of reactions do you get? Well, they can be all over the board and it really kind of depends on the kid. It also depends on how much trauma they've they've encountered over their life and um, also has a little bit to do with personality in general. So if you think about some individuals, just kind of may zone out. These are the kids that may have problems concentrating. You may actually move your class all the way out to the hallway and this is the kid that's still sitting there because they're in their own little world. They may have trouble performing uh, simple tasks. So you've given them a three-step problem, but they're still stuck on step one. Uh, lower self-esteem, they may have uh, headaches or, or stomach aches, those psychosomatic complaints. They may also have some serious mental health concerns, so depression, bipolar, anxiety. Um, and sometimes, especially with our older adolescents, uh, they all they want to know is, how do I get out of this and how can I make myself feel better? So they often turn to one of the easiest accessible things to get, and that's alcohol and or marijuana these days, both are gateway drugs. And so when you think about both of those, what do they do? Well, they tend to, especially if you're talking about alcohol being a depressant, it tends to spiral them down a little bit more um, than it should. And so we want to provide them through social emotional learning, some effective coping mechanisms, as well as some resilient skills, resiliency skills in order for them to be able to react in the moment and bounce back. So I know this is a really busy slide uh, and I apologize, but it has lots of good information. And if it's hard for you to see, you will be able to download a copy of, of this PowerPoint presentation. So think about um, the people that you work with, the, the individuals that you work with as either in the pink zone the yellow zone or the blue zone. So when we think about hyper aroused individuals, we pretty much get these if we're working in schools and we see these. We see the angry, the emotional, the externalizing types of behavior, the impulsivity, impulsivity and sometimes the even uh, rigidness um, you know, to routine and order. And I'm not talking about somebody that's necessarily on the spectrum, but just they have to have that order in order to feel safe. And sometimes they're just anxious 
anxious and overwhelmed. Then on the opposite end of that, you have those that are hypo aroused. So they're just not present in the moment. They're those disconnected individuals that just always seem to be kind of like on autopilot. For a lot of times, I would call those internalizing behaviors. And so ideally where we want people to be is in that comfort zone. So there's a good little resource. It's called, how does your motor uh, run? And when we think about our motor, if it's too high, then we're in that hyper aroused. If it's too low, when we're in that hypo aroused. And if it's just right, our engine's running smoothly. And so when we think about how do we get to that cool, calm, collected state, well, it's through the use of wonderful curriculum materials such as Sanford Harmony and video and professional development as um, Sanford Inspire. So when we think about things we can do throughout the day, regulating our own breathing, taking five minutes within the course of the day to be able to present mindfulness activities, um, recognizing one's limits, I would say I'm probably not one of the best individuals to ask about that because I tend to say yes more too often than I should. Um, and then recognizing, um, you know, statements about what's, what's coming for us and what kind of sends us over the edge. So how do we self-soothe? as not only adults, because we have to model that behavior for others, uh, especially our kids, but how can we help get our kids there as well? So what do we know about trauma and the effects? We know that basically um, trauma is like a needle on a record player and it wears a groove in the brain. And so when something non-threatening basically is happening, um, that triggers us, it triggers us to a past event. And it's almost in some cases where you know it's triggering us because you can almost go back there in terms of sights and smells and sounds. And so our body again reacts. And so what happens is if this happens over and over again, then we become very quick to trigger and very slow to deescalate. So it takes time for our bodies to recover. And so after a while, it's almost like we're on autopilot and we're real quick to trigger. Um, and what we do is we adapt to this chronic triggering. And because of that, it also changes brain chemistry because that cortisol is always there, ready to be on go because it thinks, oh my gosh, I'm triggered all the time. I need to be on the ready. So for a child in a classroom, something as simple as a teacher who raises their voice to get someone's attention may remind a child of something that occurred when maybe somebody came in and was abusive because they had used too much of a substance. And so they slammed doors at night or they started yelling. And so the teacher simply is trying to get their attention, but the kid immediately goes back to that time and place where that initial trauma occurred. Um, what you generally get are out of proportion responses. And so instead of saying, golly, what's going on? We need to say, okay, hmm, let's think about this. What did I do that possibly was a signal to send that kid down a different path? So what we get sometimes are these emotional responses. And what does that usually translate into? It translates into things like higher referrals for behavioral problems. It sometimes translates into higher special education referrals and um, even higher diagnoses for ADHD. So what happens is brain structures tend to be different. Um, and so the amygdala is that brain's emotional regulator and it has the greatest volume reduction if you're working with a student who has been diagnosed with ADHD. And so what happens is as these kids who tend to have trauma, but also tend to externalize with emotional symptomology, what happens is they begin to have this lower self-worth or this lower self-esteem. And then fear and pessimism kind of brings them down a little bit further. And then finally a spiral into hopelessness and lack of control. So that's why it's critical to kind of stop things initially and be able to uh, figure out strategies that we can really help these kids in a classroom. So what we know is we also get some long-term problems 
um, if with trauma. And that can be anything from some of the things that I've mentioned before, mental health problems, as well as physical and, um, and autoimmune problems. But it also can be chronic absenteeism, attention problems, suspension, expulsion, et cetera. So most of you are probably familiar with a, a triangle model in terms of PBIS. And so when you think of PBIS, I want you to think about how we also need to build from the ground up in terms of prevention. So it's really important to, to provide a, a, a foundation um, for all trauma-informed practice, and that's simply by ensuring that your school-wide strategies for addressing trauma and building resilience are in place, as well as recognizing and being able to support those students who are in need of more intensive interventions. So having a trauma-sensitive sensitive, uh, trauma -sensitive culture for all students is critical. It's just like having an academic curriculum. You provide the academic curriculum, whether it's reading or writing or arithmetic to all students, but you know that not all students are going to get that the first go round. And so you may have about 15% of your kids that may need more secondary intervention because they've been exposed or they're, or they're in some of those at-risk groups. And then finally, you're going to have those that you may also have to not only provide what you can within the system, but you also may have to have wraparound services, which may include outside mental health counselors or other organizations, as well as maybe even some parenting classes to help with those, um, those uh, strategies. One thing I can say about Maslow is he got it right. And so we, sti we still tend to use Maslow's hierarchy of needs um, because it's important today. If you are worried about your food, your water, your shelter, your personal security, um, your, your resources that you have, then you really can't move into love and belonging and esteem which are primarily those areas of focus when we, when we talk about really uh, mitigating the effects of trauma and working within that social emotional realm. I think it starts slow. And what do I mean by that? You know, there are some things that schools over the course of the last 20 years have put in place. We now uh, feed our kids breakfast and lunch. We also, in some instances, provide snacks and we provide opportunities for kids who have that are late coming to school, whether it's a late bus or whether they've walked, uh, they've walked and um, so parent didn't get them up or they overslept. But what we also really need to focus on is making it through to the top of this triangle, because it's only when you get to the point of self-actualization do academics really come into play. So if we're still stuck in those bottom two realms, those bottom two rungs of the triangle, then we're really not getting to the point where we are providing effective strategies and universal support. And that's what our schools need to be. Places of love, belonging, um, acceptance. So it doesn't matter um, you know, who you are, where you come from, but everybody has a place and a voice at the table. Now, I'm careful with kids because I always say, uh, I, may, I may want to hear what you have to say, but you can't always get your way. So there's a big difference between allowing them to have that opportunity for voice and choice, even though that may not be an opportunity for every activity that you do. Another person who really got it right was Dr. Daniel Goldman. And um, he refers to his research not only as emotional intelligence, but he also talks about EQ, just like IQ. And so one of the things that I've learned is that basically emotional intelligence is both learned and taught. And it is directly connected to successful outcomes. You know, IQ rarely determines success in life, but people who have great emotional intelligence often go quite far. I will also tell you that I, uh, your emotional intelligence is determined not only by your ability to be self-aware, but also to be able to self-manage, to be socially aware, and to be able to execute relationship skills and your ability to make responsible decisions. 
So it basically provides this opportunity to expand the emotional intelligence of children and adults with whom we interact on a daily basis. One of my first things that I would do when I was going into a classroom, and it doesn't matter if you're talking about a preschool classroom, a college classroom, or even a grad school classroom, is building a culture of climate. And one of the best ways that you can get people to open up and start sharing is to figure out that we all have more commonalities than we do differences. So we, we may look different on the outside and we may also think differently. And that's a good thing because I'd hate to know that everybody thought exactly like me. It causes an opportunity or it allows or lends itself to an opportunity that I think is critical in today's world. And that is just because we don't necessarily agree with everybody, um, we also have to give that opportunity to be able to allow those to express themselves and learn from others. And we do that through listening, through open engagement, and so a couple of strategies that are real easy to use. I love the buddy up system with Sanford Harmony. Um, you know, you, you share a different buddy, you're rotating different people. So you get to know everybody within a classroom. It also focuses on um, actually having students inter, uh, interchange dialogue or exchange dialogue with one another. And so they ask questions and then that other person has to respond. They also have to remember because you're not talking about yourself, you're gonna be sharing the information that your buddy shared. Other activities could be pull out a coin out of your pocket and tell me in this year, and this works for older adults better than kids, obviously, but in this year, what was something critical that went on for you? Um, in a college class, I also use a couple. I'll, I'll also ask them things like, if you could be any animal, what animal would you be and why? Or something as silly as, if you could be a small appliance, what small appliance would you be and why? And then tell me why you would be that small appliance. So any of those activities, really would benefit starting that climate conversation or starting that conversation that would add to a positive school climate. So if you're not familiar with CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning, it is top flight in terms of competency areas. And although there are some other research um, researchers out there, um, this one probably is used more than any of the rest. And so when we think about uh, this systematic approach, we're not only engaging in communities and families, schools and classrooms, but we're also engaging those five, uh, those five co core competencies to build authentic partnerships and to improve classroom instruction and learning. Um, John Pickens is going to share with you a little bit about some of their briefs coming up, and I think you're going to be really excited. If you are a teacher, it's going to give you some practical strategies to be able to work with your students. And if you are a leader trying to convince your district why this is important, it's also going to be beneficial to you as well. So for those of you who may not be aware of those core competencies, let me just briefly go cover those. The first one is self-awareness. And when we think about self-awareness, um, basically it's your ability to accurately recognize your own thoughts, your own emotions, your own values, and then how they influence each other. So one of the activities that I use a lot of times has to do with the values activity. And I, I do this with older students um, and it's kind of morbid, but I, I will tell you it works. I always ask them on their epitaph when they die, if they only had three words to describe them, what would they be? And so they seriously ponder that question for a while. And then once they write down their three, I'll ask them to take one of them off and they'll say, but, but that embodies me. It does. And then after we have a discussion, I'll say, now take the second one off. You can only have one word to describe you. So what happens is when we come into the classroom, we come with our own set of values and yet students bring their own set of values in as well. And we can't necessarily um, fault them for not adopting ours. And that's why building um, this culture of climate and respect and acceptance is so critical in order to be able to facilitate academic learning. When we think about the self-management piece, that's about the ability to self-regulate. 
so regulating those thoughts, those behaviors, those emotions. Um, and that means being able to do that in different situations, even sometimes when you're stressed. You know, can you con control those, those impulses? Can you motivate yourself to get up out of bed when you don't want to, or if you've had a late night? And can you make sure that you manage stress in an effective way? And I think one of the ways that we do is we wanna make sure that we um, not only teach kids how to set, their own goals, but to work towards not only their academic goals, but their personal goals. What we know is that kids who are, um, kids and adults who write down their goals are more likely to attain those goals. So that's another activity that you could do that's a practical activity or a skill. Then we talk about social awareness. So when we think about social awareness, that ability to be able to take another's perspective and to be able to empathize with one another um, is, is very critical. Um, that means with from people from different backgrounds and from different cultures. Now, if you have the opportunity to travel um, and it really experience not only the United States, but other countries and cultures, you can bring a little bit of that back into your classroom. One of the things that traveling has done for me is really given me a broader perspective. And yet I'm always so appreciative of the things when I come back home. The other thing has to do with relationship skills. And I will tell you that many of the individuals who work with Sanford Harmony and Sanford Inspire are dedicated to relationship skills. They communicate they actively engage, they work together well as, as a team. And those things are also critical because we're often thrown into, into groups with people that we may not know. But if you have those relationship skills by being a good listener, by communicating clearly, by cooperating with others, by resisting inappropriate social pressure, uh, sometimes that also means that going against the grain and that may be going against, um, you know, your district or your employer. Um, and I'm not telling you step too far out there on the ledge, um, but I also say don't compromise your ethics either. Uh, what else does it mean? Being able to negotiate conflict constructively because conflict is inevitable and stress just like stress. Stress is inevitable. And then finally, seeking and offering help when it's needed. And then finally, that fifth one has to do with responsible decision making. So I always believe that you should have a little bit of the inner child left. So maintain that curiosity, maintain that open mindedness, be willing to say yes and try some new things. Um, even if you've been in the field for a long period of time, there are so many things that are out there, new research, new information, a new take on something. Uh, be willing to try something different, not just stick to the normal, the normal routine. So how do we, how um, does lack of trauma awareness actually impact school climate? Well, we know that whenever we have high rates of trauma among students and staff, then we also have significant negative effects on school climate, on school culture, and on the overall conditions of learning. So students struggling with trauma responses are much more likely to escalate and act out in ways that can compromise their safety as well as the safety of others. So for example, adults may be quick to threaten students with negative consequences, or they may even escalate rather than de-escalate a problem or a situation or they may use punitive discipline styles. You know that many of you have probably de-escalated a kid and yet they've gone to somebody else who maybe doesn't have that same skill set, and the kid is whoop and back up to trigger again. So staff who feel powerless to address trauma in their own lives, um, then their students, they may send that message to them that that trauma that they've experienced is minimal or they may even overlook the effects because you have to fix yourself because you before you can fix others. Um, if you ever have the opportunity to take some of the TBRI information, one of the first things that they do is to look at your own adult attachment styles um, because how you were attached and how you grew up and what kinds of trauma you may have experienced definitely impacts who you are today 
as an adult. And so one of the things that we need to worry about is not re-traumatizing. And so we don't want to have those practices in our um, places of employment. We don't want any harshness. We don't want shaming. Um, we don't want our, our environments to become chaotic or disorganized or unpredictable or unsafe. Um, because we know this impacts not only the school, but also the school community and the uh, through climate, through engagement, through a sense of community that happens to be unfortunately compromised. And so we want to make sure that we address everything uh, and steer with our school's fundament fundamental mission, which is to promote academic achievement. So if you're a leader on this call, um, what you need to know is that basically trauma turns off a kid's learning switch. That's the takeaway. So if you want to improve your academic points overall, and there's research out there that says that you can do that by as many as 11 percentile points, um, then you need to make sure that you're invested in social emotional learning, and that means giving it time in the course of a school day. We also know that um, children who suffer from trauma are more likely to interpret people's expressions as anger. Um, so even those non-threatening things can appear threatening or worsening uh, in terms of their sense of fear. And so educators often see a misbehaving kid as a mean kid or a bad kid or an oppositional kid instead of seeing that child as maybe just a child who's afraid. Um, maybe one that's had chronic trauma exposure that's beyond that person's control. So when we think about creating those trauma sensitive schools, it's all about creating that culture that prioritizes safety, trust, choice, and collaboration. Now I know this is another busy slide and I, I apologize in advance, but I think it's important to know why this connects with trauma. Um, and why that executive functioning is so important. Executive functioning, you're talking about your frontal lobe. Um, it's your seat of memory. It's your interconnectedness. It's, the, it's basically the executive functioning skills um, are foundational to not only school readiness, but also academic success. It also is the link between school achievement and the social, emotional, and moral development. So if you've looked at some of Gillian's research or Kohlberg's research or the, some of the ones that have come after them. There are some large differences in executive functioning at kindergarten levels, but what we know is that the brain is plastic. Um, it's fixable. But you have to look at children that have experienced trauma in a little bit different way. They're almost half their chronological age in terms of where they are functioning. And so when you think about, you may be working with an adolescent who's 14, but they're more like that of seven. When you look at the child from a different lens, you're gonna react differently. And that's what I hope you do after this presentation. So now some, for some practical strategies, and I think some of you will, will like these. When we think about practical strategies, you can problem solve around the first one. So to finish a project, when a friend texts and maybe they are emotionally where they, you know, not in a good place. So young people learn best when you provide them with real life experiences and you tell them, why is this important to me? And why am I gonna have to learn this stuff? So it focuses on the skills of focus and flexibility. Spotting and planning for triggers, we all need to do a better job of. How do you recognize when those intense emotions are gonna come out? Is it from an individual that kind of takes you from zero to 60 in 2.2 seconds? Or is it maybe when you lose a game or somebody criticizes something that you do? So we need to learn how to take preventative strategies and steps for our own mental health and well-being, um, setting those long-term goals and understanding those triggers. And so that empowers youth to be more self-aware and to maintain self-control. Oh, I'm sorry. Taking a look at another uh, another's point of view is also critical and one of the social emotional competencies. Um, seeing stressors in a different way. So why parents would have a strategy like lights out at a certain time, not because they're trying to or thinking that you're uh, young or you're too much of a baby, but because they know that you need adequate sleep in order to be the best you. 
So that talks about things like awareness, flexibility, and self-control. Focusing on personally motivating goals, I think that's good for all of us, but especially during the time of adolescence, it's a time for finding one's place. And so it serves as a framework uh, for making choices not only now, but for the future. So we want to encourage our youth to try new things, to stick with it, to discover their passions, uh, because when you retire, you're going to want some passions. Um, I'm not there yet, but one of these days. And then that focuses on planning and flexibility. And then finally, on building those positive memories, um, making sure that, you know, adversity doesn't lead to, to negative self-talk or poor interactions through bullying or um, other things. We want to make sure that we give youth a great starting point and so they can have those challenges, they have a little bit of resilience, but we know that um, resilience is key for long-term success. Why is this important? Because trauma informed and social emotional learning are all connected and you can begin to see those similarities. When you think about what we need to do and what we need to, to utilize to be effective in life, it's those SEL things that are critical and important, along with that emotional quotient. So what I'm encouraging you to do is to reframe how you think of things. Unhealthy payoffs, not good. Dysfunctionality, not good. And a lot of times it's how we reframe the lens. So when we say something like, um, what's wrong with this kid? We want you to reframe that to what has happened to this child and your, and your heart softens. That's a place of growth and understanding. Resiliency, it's what it's all about. Kids need a little bit of adversity, but not too much so that they learn how to um, manage those, those knocks in life that come their way, pick themselves back up and begin again. We also know that there is lots of research on SEL and student success. And so I've just provided you a couple of information. One of, this, one of these actually refers to a meta-analysis study. Um, this one also really refers to what I would call um, why it's so important, because it almost could be seen as a, a violation of a child's rights by not providing them uh, all the things they need to be a fully functioning adult. So for us, it's about a coordinated school effort, um, starting with adverse childhood experiences, building in trauma-informed practices, making sure your preventative programs are where they need to be. Um, all of those are important for successful um, youth who grow up to, to be successful adults. So John, I hear that you have some research that you want to share with our audience today. Um, yes, we do. And thank you so much for the research that you've shared, um, recent SEL research. So we at Harmony, we're also excited to share some important research brief just released about Harmony SEL and Inspired Teaching and Learning. We developed these briefs in partnership with researchers at Johns Hopkins University to provide you with evidence of success with Harmony and Inspire, as well as practical action items that you can take to drive successful SEL implementation. You can access the briefs on our blog, as you see here. And again, we also invite you to our portal. Back to you, Dr. White. Thank you, John, for providing us so much good information. Uh, and I hope you will all take time to read those briefs. I know Caterpillar Schools has used Sanford Harmony over the last couple of years, and it really has made a difference, not only in the teachers that have utilized that, their lives, but as and in the lives of a lot of our students as well. There's another model that I just want to share with you because I think it's important, um, but the ARC model really talks about attachments. It talks about self-regulatory capacities and then also increasing one's competencies across multiple domains. So there's more information on the bridge page if you'd like to refer back to that as well. So now it's time for another poll. Yes, indeed. It's time for another quick poll. Please take a minute to answer the question on your screen so we can find out more about your own self-care practices. How much time do you spend on good self-care? Not enough, about the right amount of time. 
depends on the week or too much time. So think about in your own personal lives, what do you do for self-care and the kind of time you devote to it? And John, I'll just tell you, I'm getting a little bit better with this as I age, um, but it's taken me a long time to get there. <laughs> so maybe yeah. some of the audience members are, are, are like you and I as well, right? Yep, getting there is what's important. <laughs> Getting there is what's important, especially in this day and age, very important that we take care of ourselves because in order to continue to take great care of the students in our charge or the children in our charge or the other adults in our charge, we have to make sure that our bucket is full in order to be able to continue to fill theirs for them and with them. So true, so true. And in a COVID-19 year, it was even more important for that self, good self-care to be uh, a number one priority in your life. I know many of our teachers experience not only teaching in person, but hybrid and virtual all at the same time. So good self-care was the way to get through uh, an interesting year. Very true. And as you're thinking about the time you Think about what types of self-care. We There's standard ones that we all think about, go for a walk, go to the gym, but late, in a slide a little later, we wanna think about some different, more creative ways of self-care. So if you wanna give some thought to that too, as you're thinking about the amount of time you spend on self-care. So John, do we have a lot of, uh, of responses coming in? Um, we do. So right now, 37%, not enough time. For about the right amount of time, 21%. And the one that I thought would come in, it depends on the week, is 41%. <laughs> and only 1% said too much time. So I guess no big surprise there. Not really. I'm glad I'm in the same boat with a lot of a lot of my fellow uh, educators and mental health professionals. All right. So if you've ever flown before, you know the first thing that they tell you is in case of an emergency, put your oxygen mask on first. It's important that you do that. And just to kind of share a few out of the box kind of thinking things, um, I actually purchased a couple of cats from a, a place in Atlanta, Georgia, and they have a live video cam in kitten tans. And so when I'm feeling stressed at work, I can't always escape, but I can always take two minutes for me. And so I plug in that live kitten feed and there's nothing like Siamese and Tonkinese cats running around like wild things to make me go, ha. Huh. Uh, teaching teaching uh, uh, cats or dogs new, new skills, in, engaging in uh, fun activities, even creating maybe gnomes or fairy gardens uh, as ways for when people come in, they see something new, they, they think they see it in a planner and then all of a sudden they go, oh, Oh, look, it's a little mini scene. So whatever floats your boat um, with any of those opportunities and activities. So I hope that we've covered what I said that we would in our objectives. Um, and we talked a little bit about trauma, about the stress response, a little bit of Maslow, and then also provided you hopefully some practical strategies um, to be able to utilize, uh, if not this year, if your school year is letting out uh, next school year, or if you're in mental health, uh, maybe you can utilize those throughout the summer. So John, back to you. Yep, and I'm seeing a lot of great ways, you know, someone asked, where is the kitten cam? And different farms, set gardens and things like that. But just jumping really quickly into this current slide that's up, thank you, Dr. White, for everything that you've shared. We've learned so much about the power of utilizing SEL resources. We also want to invite everyone to visit our online learning portal and check out our no-cost resources, like our quick connection cards to help build student communities on the Harmony portal. And we have several Inspire modules that also provide a wealth of resources for learning more about trauma-informed instruction. So Dr. White, thank you again for that in-depth presentation about the impact of trauma on learning and how we can best improve school climates with an SEL focus. We learned so much from you today and we know there are more questions out there. We have a few minutes to take some of your questions. Feel free to write any questions in the question and answer box and we will ask a few now. And so one that came up early on was an average age, and I don't know if you have the research on that, but an average age that you start seeing behaviors from children who have experienced trauma. 
you know, it really does depend on the type of trauma and um, not only the pro-social factors, but also um, the risk factors. So when you think about a general answer, that's very difficult to answer because there are some children that, that do have a skill set, no matter how difficult the trauma, and then there are others who just one or two things can really send them over the edge. I think just as a general rule, if you will um, continue to think about the child as being about half of their chronological age, it will explain a lot in great detail. And I know I kind of went through a couple of those slides um, just previously, but I have shared some other uh, information that I think will be valuable, a couple of TED Talks, as well as a couple of references, a couple of book references that I think are valuable, and some, um, some um, national websites, uh, one from West Ed, of course, CASEL, um, PBIS, and a few others. So any other questions? Well, with what we're going to do now, because we're close on time, is you have Dr. Oh, we lost uh, John for a minute there. Are you back, John? Okay, now I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, again, thank you for answering that question. And we see a number of questions popping up in the chat box, but due to time, we'll ask that you reach out to Dr. White directly. Her contact information is here. If you want to send out an email to her, she'll answer those questions for you. And we also want to thank each of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to hear about how SCL can improve climate and mitigate the effects of trauma. We'd also look forward to having you join us on a couple upcoming webinars that we have. On June 17th, we're co-hosting a free virtual event with Panorama where we'll be discussing SEL assessments and the valuable role they play in SEL programs. You can register at no cost on the link here on your screen. In addition to that, on June 24th at 1 p.m. Pacific time and 4 p.m. Eastern time, we'll host our next monthly webinar. It's time to celebrate what we've accomplished and be inspired for the school year ahead. We have invited Dr. Sarah Rim Kaufman to lead an amazing panel of educators and administrators who will share their reflections about the most incredible year and how to best prepare with SEL as a focus when we welcome all of our students back for the new school year. You can register on our website today. And John, while I'm setting up the next one, I would just like to thank both you and Amanda and the entire staff at uh, Sanford Harmony and Sanford Inspire Y'all's teams really have dedicated your, your mission and goal to improving the lives of students through research and providing top flight SEL evidence-based curricula for individuals. Thank you very much for that, Barzana. We work really hard to fulfill that mission on a daily basis, both at Harmony SEL and Inspire Teaching and Learning. Want to supercharge your Harmony SEL implementation? Explore everyday practices, lessons, and activities, or the latest Harmony resources with a live presenter. Register for virtual training sessions now in the Harmony Online Learning Portal. Visit online.harmonysel.org for more information. you have to say it twice so once this webinar comes to a close a survey will launch on your screen it's a very short survey and we would really appreciate your feedback we do read the feedback from every response and we take it very seriously to this day your responses have helped us build more successful webinars before we close we just want to again thank you for your participation Thank you again, Dr. White, and thank you, everyone. You have a wonderful day.